Good evening, Brian, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi's weekly lockdown lecture series. I do believe this is meeting number 36 during Remembrance Tide. At uh, this minute in time, can I thank all of you for uh, your efforts over the weekend, uh, representing your lodges and the craft, and paying due respect to all those who've served our nation uh, and all the conflicts since the First World War. Thank you for that, Brian. At this point, Brian, can I remind you all of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines on Facebook and Zoom meetings that uh, please keep your video on and a name that I recognise in the box. If you do have to uh, put your video off due to bandwidth, that's fine. As long as you send me a little message, that would be much appreciated. Well, Brian, this, this evening, uh, we're, I'm delighted to welcome to us uh, a very well-known and very well-respected brother amongst the craft. He's uh, from across the pond. He's one of our American cousins. Uh, but I first came across uh, Dr. Oscar Allen in the Internet Lodge uh, down in Manchester Way. And he's here this evening as a member of the Internet Lodge. He's an author, a researcher. He's an editor of many books. And he's got a, quite a large following for his presentations around the world. So without further ado... Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Oscar Allen. Thank you very much, Varagrin. It's such an awesome opportunity to present uh, to you today. And if you don't mind, I'm going to jump right into it, if that's okay. All right. Uh, so I was asked to give a presentation on uh, Prince Hall Freemasonry. Um, and uh, it is an interesting uh, conversation uh, because it's not going to be as... Um, uh, it's not going to be Pollyannish, if you understand my point. I'm going to walk you through uh, particular perspectives on this. Now, I say that because oftentimes when people hear about Prince Hall Freemasonry, uh, there's uh, oftentimes the understanding that, oh, that's, that's where uh, uh, men of color or Black men were first able to become Freemason. But we actually understand that history reveals that there have been men of color in free speculative Freemasonry uh, from the ages, somewhat even uh, at the earlier time in the uh, early 17th century, uh, in 16th century, oh, 17th, no, nope, I'm sorry, 16th, 16th, 18th century. Um, now, we know that because Angelo Solomon uh, was a Freemason in Vienna around 1781. We know that Joseph Ballone, uh, who was known as the uh, Black Mozart or one of the first men of color to be made a Freemason um, under France, uh, was a member of the Lodge of Nine Sisters in around 1773. So this concept of men of color being in Freemasonry is not something that is new or only germane to the American uh, shores. Uh, we know uh, also that in and around 1798, John Richardson Primrose Bowlby was initiated in Union and Crown Lodge in Glasgow. Um, and uh, he, was, he was also exalted as a Royal Arch in January of 1798. And he incidentally was a member of both in the Grand Lodge of Scotland, and of course, a member of a Modern's Lodge in uh, Kingston and Hull um, later on. So the whole idea is that we know that men of color have been in Freemasonry. Uh, there's also, uh, because of my uh, you know, Scottish background to some extent, uh, we know there's that story, unfortunately, of Jack Johnson being initiated in Lodge 225 in Dundee, uh, and then later on having that membership being rescinded. Uh, we know in uh, New Jersey, uh, the first, uh, one of the first lodges that had uh, the most men of color in a, what we call regular mainstream Freemasonry was Alpha Lodge number 116. Uh, and of course here we see 1900s uh, men also being inducted and initiated and admitted into uh, Edinburgh Lodge. So the concept of having men of color Freemasonry really shouldn't be one that should uh, really bat an eye, but in actuality we know that's uh, far from the case. Uh, so. As I describe uh, African-American Freemasonry in the US, it is best to capture it from three particular levels, that of Prince Hall affiliated, uh, and then I'm gonna confuse you, that of Prince Hall origin, and then that of non-Prince Hall. And you're probably scratching your head as, what is he talking about? Just bear with me and I'll walk you through this. Uh, but let's take a look back 
and I'm purposely doing this step back because of the issues with we, uh, what we've known historically with how Prince Hall Freemasonry and other masonry has been um, labeled. Uh, early on, there was this concept that Prince Hall Masonry was uh, illegitimate and therefore clandestine. Um, and I take you back to 1752, uh, specifically that of the ancient Grand Lodge, whereas we see that uh, Lawrence Dumont uh, and his role as Grand Secretary um, has actually uh, written and entered into this uh, concern, a complaint uh, made uh, against two gentlemen by the name of Thomas Phelan and John Mackey. And these two men essentially were creating what they call uh, a leg of mutton masons. Uh, basically, they were duping people into uh, becoming masons and charging them the right old sum of a leg of mutton. Um, and unfortunately, they um, had uh, oftentimes um, uh, tricked and uh, deceived individuals who believed that they were receiving the Masonic art or the royal art of masonry, including that of the royal arch degrees. What was interesting was that they fooled one gentleman uh, and told him that uh, by virtue of uh, becoming a member of this, 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 this body, that he was able to render himself invisible uh, as long as, of course, they, they, he pays the um, handsome uh, sum of the leg of mutton. So the Grand Committee of the Ancients uh, unanimously agreed that these men uh, should never be admitted to any lodge in their natural lives. And here you see a record of them showing on the black list, um, which shows uh, Thomas Phelan and John Mackey, uh, a, a, alias Dr. Mackey, placed uh, in the first two rungs of the, uh, the uh, register indicated that these are persons who are deemed unworthy of our society. Now, I say that because we're going to transition into the conversation about Prince Hall Freemasonry, and specifically in a legalistic term, Prince Hall Affiliated Freemasonry. It is the official recognized body that we have in the United States. Prince Hall uh, is said to have been born in and around 1738, and he is known um, in our circles as the father of Black Masonry. He was a proponent for equal treatment of Blacks and education of Black children, and significantly, he was an abolitionist and very much staunch uh, opponent uh, to the slavery, to slavery in the U.S., and specifically that of the slave trade. And I point your attention to these images. There is no real clear image of Prince Hall and everything that you've seen um, to the right has really been a rendering of what people have imagined that he um, looks like. Uh, the color drawing in the middle is actually one that I've been working with a known uh, histor a known artist uh, in trying to give a much more realistic uh, depiction of Prince Hall based on what we do know of him without the uh, necessary uh, needing to put on the accoutrements of wigs, et cetera, because most folks uh, did not uh, dress that way, um, as we can see in that time within the African American community. Now, Prince Hall was a military man. We see that he did serve in the regimental army um, and uh, was paid for some of his services there. Uh, and we know that he and other 14 other free black men were initiated by Sergeant John Batt on March 6, 1778. Batt was a member of the Lodge 441 under the Irish constitution that was attached to the 38th Regiment of Foot in the British Army that was stationed in Boston at that time. What is important to recognize uh, the following, Bat was the only individual who we see on record as having uh, been on record for initiating Prince Hall and these other men. What is also important to the story is that Bat at the time when he did this was uh, detached from the, from the military uh, service in addition to the lodge. The lodge, the, the lodge and the regiment after the battle in Boston had left and gone up to Nova Scotia. At Nova Scotia is when Bat got discharged from military service. The regiment moves with the lodge and goes relocates from Nova Scotia to New York, uh, the lower right hand corner here. And Bat is left back in Nova Scotia. Um, they, we know they're in New York because they actually help in the lodge, helps uh, as being part of the 20 so lodges that helped form the first provincial Grand Lodge of the state of New York. And Bat was not there. In fact, we see that he later leaves Nova Scotia and ends up back in Boston, where we anticipate that he essentially is a uh, merchant of fortune um, and charges Prince Hall and these men to be made Masons. So for lack of a better word, historically, they were uh, not made legitimate Masons given uh, Bat's lack of authority to do so. 
but there were 15 men who were founders of African Lodge Number no. 1. And despite the irregularity of their formation, they earnestly wanted and desperately uh, provided uh, the work that was associated with being a Masonic uh, body. Uh, we know that because we see that the legend tells us that they were uh, allowed to walk in procession on St. John's Day. They receive others and that we see the records where they've actually initiated, initiated others into Freemasonry. And their records were uh, very staunch with respect to maintaining that activity. Now, what happened was in 1780s, it turns out that uh, there uh, several of these men were seafaring brothers, uh, and one or two ended up in London, where they needed uh, charity, charity, charity care, and uh, they approached uh, Lodge Number no. Five Five in London, whose master was William Moody, who uh, receives them and tests them, and, and really gives them the charity that they needed at the time. And they came back to Prince Hall and said, we were received by these brothers in London uh, and the worshipful masses, Will and Moody, and they treated us with respect. They accepted us as brothers. And from that moment, we can say that Prince Hall uh, became Facebook friends with John Moody uh, and started to exchange a lot of uh, communication back and forth. And in the, in telling his side of the story about how they were being received and treated in Boston, Moody tells Prince Hall, well, why don't you apply from the fountain of the source of Freemasonry uh, to the extent of, you know, how these London guides would say, um, and uh, apply to become uh, a, or for a petition uh, from from London. Um, and as a result, you see here is the actual 1784 petition for a charter that, that Prince Hall writes to Moody and Moody and then takes to the Grand Lodge of England, uh, Premier Grand Lodge and requests a charter on behalf of his friend uh, in uh, Boston. We see that the Premier Grand Lodge did charter this lodge um, and named it African Lodge Number no. 459. However, that warrant did not arrive in the US until 1787. African Lodge contributed to the charity fund. They communicated quite extensively on Prince Hall behalf to the Grand Secretary and others. And we, we found that uh, a couple of interesting things happened. When the United Grand Lodge of England was formed through the unification of the ancients and moderns, several lodges outside of London uh, specifically were dropped from the role and African Lodge, among others, were dropped uh, from that extent. Remember that portion of the story. The reason I, I, I asked you to take note of that is this is the actual charter that still uh, exists of Africa Lodge number 459. Uh, what transpired uh, with the damage, essentially the story goes, uh, the Grand Lodge was um, had a fire and the Grand Master was reported to run in to um, you know, risk his life for the purposes of protecting and saving and procuring the charter. Why? This charter, my brothers, has been the bone of contention for over 200 years uh, in American and in Masonic history. There's been hundreds if not, there's scores to hundreds of documents and letters and reports and books written, uh, really being derisive around the existence of this charter and stating that the charter was either ill-gotten uh, or doesn't exist or was a fraud or uh, was fake news for lack of a better word. Um, and on the flip side, the brothers of, of Prince Hall Freemasonry have recognized that this charter is no different than any of the other charters that uh, have been born out of uh, American Freemasonry that came out of the uh, the uh, the English, or I should say the uh, the British, either Scottish, Irish, or uh, British side of the coin. And as that as that case comes to bear, their perspective is this charter is nothing more than the holy grail from their level of understanding or under or embrace because it justifies and legitimizes their existence, which for hundreds of years they were told they were less than human and therefore not being recognized as being legitimate Freemasons. Prince Hall uh, recognized that even in 1787, when he writes back to the Grand Secretary um, and uh, the Grand Master Pro Tem, thanking them for sending him the charter. Uh, and we know in 1827, the 
African Lodge was not included in the formation of the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. They just obviously didn't want anything to do with the African Lodge at that time. So African Lodge forms itself into a Grand Lodge. It's called, basically called the African Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. They later on rename it as the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. But essentially, every to most Prince Hall Grand Lodges are descended from what is now uh, most, I should say, not every, from the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. And it was not until 1994 that we see the United Grand Lodge of England move that the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts should now be accepted as regular and recognized, followed by the administrations of the Grand Lodge of Ireland and Scotland to that extent. And what were some of the reasons for that? The conversation oftentimes when you read uh, the really uh, harsh language that was put up uh, being a counter to Prince Hall recognition was that uh, people would say, well, they were not formed by three lodges because you know Grand Lodges are formed by three lodges. But we know in, in the 18th century, there were three Grand Lodges in North America that are totally seen as being legitimate that were not formed by three lodges, but by two. Then we have the Grand Lodge of New Jersey, the neighbor uh, to New York, which was not even formed by uh, three or two Grand Lodges, but I mean, two lodges, but by a grand convention of master masons. So if you think about it, the standards then prevail in the formation of Prince Hall Grand Lodge in Massachusetts is no different than any of the other uh, mainstream Grand Lodges that we can see. And finally, the United Grand Lodge of England's uh, re uh, resolution uh, was that uh, Prince Hall Freemasonry should be uh, recognized as being of exemplary regularity and, uh, and deemed uh, va um, valued for a recognition. Now, since 1994 and technically 1989, uh, when Connecticut was the first Grand Lodge to enter into recognition with its Prince Hall sister Grand Lodge, we have seen the uh, growth of the number of Prince Hall Grand Lodges that have entered into amity agreements with their uh, sister state Grand Lodges. And now we currently have 44 out of 51 US Masonic jurisdictions, including Hawaii, DC, and Alaska, who have uh, extended recognition to their Prince Hall members, um, it's Prince Hall Grand Lodges. Now, the color here is going to be a little bit um, deceiving. Uh, specifically, we know that uh, what, the, what the recognition here, it falls under three categories. There is, we, can re we recognize you exist, but you cannot visit us uh, on both sides. We recognize you exist and you have limited opportunity to visit us. Uh, we recognize you exist and we can intervisit without any issues. And I, I lied, there's a fourth. We recognize you exist and only three states permit you to have plural membership uh, across uh, the two jurisdictions. That is Connecticut, Minnesota, and Kansas. All the rest, the Prince Hall Grand Lodges, do not permit plural membership. Now, I'm taking a little bit of a detour through uh, the Pennsylvania for a minute because I want to <laughs> explain that though uh, the current message is that the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts is the oldest Grand Lodge uh, for Prince Hall Masons, that's not actually the case. We know that because there were free men who were either out of English or Irish lodges that were made English, from English or Irish lodges uh, that formed uh, the African Grand Lodge of, in Philadelphia through uh, connection with the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. I mean, the, I'm sorry, African Lodge 459 of Massachusetts. These were very staunch men who were uh, men of the cloth, Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, and a few others. And we know that in 1815, they were the actual first group that formed a Grand Prince Hall Grand Lodge, which was called the first independent Grand Lodge of North America, where Absal Absalom Jones became the first Grand Master. Uh, and as with most things with American uh, culture, the African-American experience, we see African-American Freemasonry grow in lockstep with the ability for the black church to also grow because those were most of the scenarios where uh, people of color were enabled to assemble without um, running into issues by virtue of uh, being assembled for the purposes of church. Otherwise, it was totally illegal for people of color to have any kind of assembly uh, because of course, the issues of slavery as well as um, uh, discrimination. Now, how many of you know about the Buffalo Soldiers? And I'm not talking about the Bob Marley song. The Buffalo Soldiers um, were, uh, several of them were members of the Prince Hall family. In fact, we found some of the military Masonic lodges embedded within the regiments of the Buffalo Soldiers. Primarily, they were chartered by the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Texas and Missouri. 
and they've been uh, championed with so many uh, congressional medals of honor by virtue of the work that they did in securing what is now the borders of the US at that time, period of time. Prince Hall Grand Lodges uh, have a conference of grandmasters, much as there is this connection of the several different grand lodges across the US as well as in Europe, et cetera. And we see that they have, um, of course, their executive officers to that extent uh, that they come together on an annual basis to share uh, camaraderie with respect to Prince Hall. Now, in the American mainstream conference of grandmasters, we do extend um, connection to the Prince Hall Grand Lodges, uh, recognizing, of course, that there are still several, seven or so uh, states that do not have uh, an amity with their Prince Hall uh, brethren. Prince Hall presence is very strong. And there are over 5,000 lodges, 47 grand lodges with over 300,000 members worldwide. And you can say that there's a significant pride and honor for those men who are members of the Prince Hall family, mainly because of the history, both from civil rights uh, and even current in, in, in past concerns where their leadership and their membership was in lock and step with the plight and the fight for uh, freedom as well as uh, equality uh, in American culture. Now, I'm gonna take another detour uh, to talk to you about uh, this historic, if you guys are history buffs, you may have heard about this Baltimore convention that happened in the 1840s. This convention came out after the, um, the major issue we had with the Morgan affair um, and where people were taking copies of rituals and claiming to be Freemasons and there were all these exposés. Uh, so one of the things that transpired out of the convention was the adoption of a uh, similarity of the ritual work and the requirement that uh, business be only conducted on the third degree. The third element was this thing that was created called the dues card. And the dues card is an American innovation that came out of the, uh, the Baltimore Convention. Um, therefore, instead of walking with your member certificate, you actually walk with a dues card indicated on an annual basis that you are a subscribed member. Now, in 1847, there was an additional Prince Hall Convention in Boston, Massachusetts with delegates from the African Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, First Independent African Grand Lodge of North America, Higher Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, and Boyer Lodge of New York. If you notice here, there are two Grand Lodges in Pennsylvania, and you probably figure out, well, what, what's, what's going on there? Apparently, out of the First Independent Grand Lodge, a couple of men were expelled. And instead of going away you know, quietly, they decided that they were going to form a rival Grand Lodge uh, and, extend, and started to really exchange um, uh, not brevities, but very uh, ensconced um, uh, arguments back and forth, denigrating each other. So in an attempt to quell the impact that this was having, uh, the uh, Grand Lodge of Massachusetts and others came together to say, let's bring all these Warren parties together around the table. Now, what transpired out of that meeting uh, wasn't a merger of the two lodges, I mean the two Grand Lodges, but a creation of a totally new animal. They created a national Grand Lodge, which is called the Compact or Prince Hall Origin, that essentially uh, was um, the governing body over all Prince Hall Lodges in its design. Uh, and it was credited with creating an additional grand bodies and more specifically unifying the work, the ritual work across the US for Prince Hall Freemasonry and more specifically laying a role in the network of lodges that exist, that assisted with the underground railroad system, which was the secret routes and safe houses uh, used to help people of color escape from uh, slavery in the South into freedom in the North in Canada. Now, every, everything, as you know, Masons, they never can agree. Uh, and we see as, as soon as they started, there's this um, schisms that occurred within the National Grand Lodge. And most of the state Grand Lodges of Prince Hall said there's something wrong with this setup and they withdrew from that. And we see now in 1994, an effort was made to call themselves Prince Hall affiliated. The National Grand Lodge, the argument was that they disappeared, but they actually continued and reformed and continued to say that they still exist, calling themselves Prince Hall Origin and getting into uh, significant dust ups with the Prince Hall affiliated guys. The third group is the non-Prince Hall, and I'm really going to throw you for a loop here, but these are the mostly what we are saying are straight up clandestine, illegitimately created and totally bogus. Some of them are just money making fraudulent business schemes to take, take people's money. Uh, others are uh, spirits to the extent of just created out of thin air. 
And I can show you just this example of the number of these grand lodges that exist in the state of New York. Started from 1907 uh, till, as you can see, 1985, you were probably saying, wow, you had no idea that these were all uh, the several independent grand lodges that seem to exist in New York. But that list is not over. There's even more. And they see it even more still. And even more recently, we've seen groups created as recently as 2016. Now, I bring this up because predominantly these are Grand Lodges that are not legitimate or recognized by the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of New York, nor the Grand Lodge of New York, or other Grand Lodges across that, for that, um, for the regular world, for that extent. But the majority of them are uh, predominantly of men of color because of this period of time where the separation of the races or Freemasonry by race and ethnicity has led to kind of the opportunity to cultivate these uh, independent groups that claim to be Freemasons and act as, and act as such without any, uh, any kind of uh, repercussion. Now, I say that because New York does have the honor of having the largest number of these uh, irregular or illegitimate and unrecognized bodies, but we're followed by California, uh, then subsequently followed by Illinois, uh, and then subsequently followed by Texas. Um, so when you look at these gentlemen, they dress differently. And, and I, I'm bringing this up because it's important, especially as we engage on social media, both in the lockdown uh, and across the Masonic realm, it is important to do your due diligence and really ascertain just because someone has a square and compass and say that they're a Mason, it doesn't mean that they are a regular legitimate body, uh, especially if they're um, you know, claimed to be a Mason that is Prince Hall or you assume they're to be Prince Hall because they are uh, men of color. Um, another group came up in 2005, called themselves the Regular Grand Lodge of England, um, and this group uh, claimed to have formed on the old uh, constitutions, and what they did is they went back and started to recharter these uh, clandestine unrecognized bodies in the U.S. and formed them into uh, what they call Regular Grand Lodges, claiming to have an English charter. Um, and you could see there, they have all the accoutrements, all the uh, snazzy regalia, and they were formed by a gentleman there in the white who was expelled from United Grand Lodge of England a number of years ago, who decided to form his own group. Uh, you probably saw in the news some inkling about this, uh, uh, you know, conspiracy uh, theory about a Masonic fraternal police. Here we found a guy and a bunch of groups who approached the, um, the police departments in the U.S. and California claiming to be the Masonic fraternal police department uh, and, uh, and endeavoring to uh, engage in some sort of relationship. Uh, of course, they were charged with impersonating police officers and were arrested. Uh, unfortunately, this gentleman decided that he wanted to show up to court wearing his Masonic regalia because he was the Grand Master of the Fraternal Police Department, which was an illegitimate body that none of the regular bodies knew anything about. But unfortunately, we bear the brunt of the exposure because people don't take the time to uh, denote the difference and just automatically say, well, you guys are all Freemasons, so you all have this crazy, you know, subversive group that's going around, uh, which was not the case. Um, in 2019, these illegitimate bodies, again, un unrecognized bodies, uh, decided that they were going to initiate uh, and make uh, Louis Farrakhan a member uh, with the hopes of trying to gain legitimacy by having a, uh, a, a, an individual of, of that uh, status in the community. Unfortunately for them, uh, that makes no difference because of not only the controversial nature, but the specifics that, um, you know, we don't recognize, uh, you know, this group as being legitimate, no matter who they uh, decide as a political statement uh, to try to, uh, you know, get endorsements from, you know, their irregularity does not change overnight. So I say that because they're over roughly about 300 or so predominantly black, uh, non Prince Hall Grand Lodges across the US that cannot prove their lineage to African Lodge number 459. Now we know that there not only uh, exists in the uh, African American population, there are several uh, white, there are European Grand Lodges that are unrecognized that some of these groups have interacted with. Uh, but the reality is, as I go back to the story of Prince Hall Freemasonry, Prince Hall died in 1807. 
And in our estimation, just looking at his legacy alone and what he was able to uh, accomplish, and even his his uh, his uh, desire uh, to uh, fight for the opportunity for men of color to become regular Freemasons, I have been able to uh, to gain some benefit of that as well. Being that while I'm not a member of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge, I am a member of a regular Grand Lodge, which um, you know has had to open its doors as well to welcome people of all faiths and religions and ethnicities and races uh, because we recognize that masonry uh, is both American history and told, I should say, world history to that extent. Thank you, my brothers. Oscar, thank you so much for giving us uh, an insight and introduction into Prince Hall Freemasonry in America. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had Brother Moses Gomez speak to us about the Underground Railroad. And that was where I think some of the interest was piqued by some of our brethren. And they asked me if I could find someone who can come and give us the background of Prince Hall Masonry. And I think you've very much been able to accomplish that this evening. What we normally do now, uh, Oscar, is we see if there's any questions in the chat and we will do a moderated uh, question and answer session. Um, let me just scroll down here. So we've got some people with bandwidth. I uh, challenges. Uh, so, an excellent presentation. I don't think we've got. Have we got any questions, brother, for Oscar? He's come all the way from uh, the United States of America for us. Uh, or has some of the comments put everybody off uh, this evening? I. Uh, Oscar, we don't seem to have any questions this evening, but uh, can I thank you very much uh, from coming from Internet Lodge this evening to speak to us. Uh, what we do have, uh, are the, rit the rituals similar to the ones that you work under the United Grand Lodge of England as a member of Internet Lodge, Oscar? No. So the American Freemasonry has taken a different turn to some extent uh, from what is practiced, you know, emulation and the others. Um, side of the coin. Uh, so uh, a lot of it was an adaptation of two streams of, of Masonic ritual, that being, you know, there's the ancient ritual, which the Grand Lodge of uh, uh, Pennsylvania uh, and the Grand Lodge of uh, South Carolina practice because of their lineage to the ancient Grand Lodge, whereas everyone else kind of has that modern um, modern um, interplay. And not modern to the extent of having emulation ritual as practiced in England, uh, but specifically a mixture of what is uh, called uh, Preston Webb lectures um, and, um, and, I'm sorry, Preston Webb, Preston's lectures with Thomas McWebb's adaptation from the American palate. Uh, so we kind of say that ours is a mixture of Preston uh, slash Thomas Smith Webb uh, to that extent. And the Prince Hall uh, ritual is uh, akin to uh, that. So most American ritual uh, does have that, sig that significant uh, genetic connection connectivity uh, to that extent. Okay, thank you. I've got a question to, to from- Robert's question, I, I see the message here. Um, you know, I think we were very clear that I, I'm here on be on uh, under the auspices of being a member of the uh, Grand Lodge, a Lodge under UGLE and a Lodge under Ireland. So, yeah, shouldn't thanks. be any issues here, Rob. Uh, he, Robert, does congratulate you on your presentation, however, as well. I, a question that the African Lodge has shown. Are they, and I'm not sure of the political correct terminology here, Oscar, so please forgive me. Are they for colored, the colored only? No. So the misconception that um, Prince Alfred Freemasonry are only for black men or African American men is uh, furthest from the truth. Uh, they are uh, men of all races that um, can uh, and are members. There are men that are, um, you know, of, 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 Asia, of Asian background, uh, Latino background, you know, um, European, you know, uh, Caucasian background. So it is not only uh, open for men of color. Uh, predominantly, that was the primary entry point uh, for men of color to get into Freemasonry. Uh, but as it stands, the uh, Prince Hall Lodges, while 
um, while they while the men those who are non-black are obviously um, smaller in numbers, but they do not um, they do not deny people membership just on the basis of their race. Okay. Do you know, Oscar, were any of the pro-abolition MPs in Europe known to be in the craft? The abolition MPs in Europe. Now, the irony in all of this, um, the first the, the first Grand Master who signs the charter, or I should say the first pro tem Grand Master that signs the charter for uh, Africa Lodge 459, um, going back, and I've been working with uh, another historian, John Belton, about this particular topic. Going back, we find that he was very much against uh, the, uh, the, the British uh, engagement with the American colonists. Uh, specifically, um, he uh, being also a member of parliament, and I believe also um, a member of the royal family, family to some extent, the Earl of Effingham, he had decided that he was going to forego um, his uh, ability or his right to lead the uh, military group um, into battle in uh, in the U.S. or in America at the time. Um, and he, in fact, is the one that signs off on the petition for 459. Uh, so we know that to some extent he's somewhat anti, he's obviously still pro-English, but he was anti uh, the, uh, the role of how England was engaging with the uh, colonists. Um, and from the perspective of being, I believe he was a Whig at the time, uh, was also um, to some extent um, anti-slavery. So the perspective that we're still trying to follow through is to get a little bit more material to see was his effort to sign off on this charter a kind of a uh, a finger and you know fly the ointment to the the uh, the the British response in addition to recognizing uh, he can put a tailor on his um, you know on his message around equality so that's still up for for discussion uh, but that's that's the one that I think has been most uh, most interesting uh, for the. Uh, to uh, with respect to the question that was asked. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Stevie Chalmers, can I, and he's asking if we can go back to the French Lodge of Sister, and he's got a question mark. So, Which French Lodge is that? I'm sorry. Stevie, do you want to pose your question, please? Do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, Nine, nine Sisters Lodge. So, oh, that Lodge of Nine Sisters, which was the uh, I was speaking about specifically the Angelo, not Angelo Solomon, uh, Chevalier uh, St. George, who was a member. He was the first uh, man of color. He was born in uh, Guadeloupe, uh, one of the French, of course, uh, colonies, and had uh, moved back uh, to Paris with his uh, father. Uh, his mother was, I believe, Senegalese. His father was a, a white uh, French planter. Um, and he moved back to Paris and became a very well-known musician. You should actually look up his work. And he is the first uh, man of color to be made a member of the Lodge of Nine Sisters in Paris. It's, I think that's the question. Hope I answered it. I think so. I, I'm getting a thumbs up, I think. Uh, Sandy Thompson's asking, Oscar, would he be right in thinking that the Grand Lodge of South Carolina does not recognize Prince Hall Masonry? So, so yes, this Grand Lodge of South Carolina does not, um, does not recognize Prince Hall Masonry. Uh, in addition to Tennessee, there are seven and they're all in the South. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a comment from one of our Dundee Masons saying, Oscar, there's nothing unfortunate about Jack Johnson being made a Mason in Dundee. The Bren of 225 are very proud to have him made a Mason. And I know yeah. that uh, yeah. many of our Bren, there, there's, uh, they do talk about Jack Johnson with great pride and they've got uh, a few lectures about him as well and his uh, history. Yeah, the unfortunate, the, the reason I made the comment about unfortunate was that that got rescinded, right? Um, after there were threats being made both by the American Grand Lodges and then I believe there was an investigation made uh, by the Grand Lodge of Scotland um, and founded that uh, the, the brothers initiated him uh, irregularly. So the, they rescinded his membership. So that's what I meant by the unfortunate nature of that. Okay, thank you. A question from one of my own past masters from a mother lodge. Can one be a member of a Prince Hall Lodge and a, a regular American Grand Lodge? There are only three Grand Lodges that permit plural membership. 
Um, on the mainstream Grand Lodge side, meaning the side where most of the American Grand Lodges are, uh, they don't have these restrictions on membership. You can be a plural member of any, as long as you can pay your subscriptions. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the concern and the size of Prince Hall Grand Lodges, and even the concern of being swallowed up by the mainstream Grand Lodges, uh, they have kind of uh, formed the opinion that uh, their members cannot have plural membership. In fact, they don't even permit their members to have plural membership even within their jurisdiction. So you can't even be a Prince Hall member of multiple lodges within your state. Uh, so uh, what is required is you have to demit from one lodge to go to the other lodge. Um, and uh, there are only three states, uh, Connecticut since 1989, uh, Minnesota and the state of Kansas. They actually have entered into agreements with uh, each other where they permit uh, the members to be in a regular American, uh, I should say a mainstream Grand Lodge and a Prince Hall Lodge. Everyone else, the only way you can do so is by um, essentially being an honorary member, which Prince Hall may say, we'll make you an honorary member. There is a third option, which is not a, it's not a real brick and mortar lodge. You, if you go into the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts's website, uh, they uh, symbolically in the term of, you know, once every two years, open up uh, African Lodge number one, and they have a subscription where you can actually become a symbolic member of Africa Lodge. It's like say you go to Disney World and you came back with a t-shirt, but you get a you get a, a jewel, a, a member certificate and a, a copy of the, uh, the lodge uh, char charter. So that's something you can also explore and you can do that online as well. Okay, thank you, Oscar. There's a couple of more questions about Jack Johnston being made illegally and that the members of the lodge were expelled. And then there's a, another comment there. It, it was complaints from the US that objected to Jack Johnston being admitted a Mason in Dundee. So I think there's a big story there. Yes. Uh, I got a comment from a past master of Internet Lodge. Uh, we're honoured to have you as a member. Uh, <laughs> I... According to Google in 2012, there were 40 Grand Lodges of Prince Hall Masons in the world presiding over 5,000 lodges. Is that correct now? No, there's, it's more than 40. Um, there are a few places where the three states govern. Um, you know, so for example, um, Utah, Colorado, um, in Washington, I mean, they're mixed under one, uh, but that's why it's not 51, um, 51 states uh, under the, um, or 51 states and territories under the Prince Hall side. They're roughly about 47, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. A question from Michael Monroe. Is the ritual similar to York Rite? And do you open your meetings in the third degree or Prince Hall meetings in the third degree? Um, the Prince Hall side? Yeah. So when you say York right, uh, I always got to make sure I clarify. There's the American York right, which is the Royal Arch, uh, uh, Royal Select, and the Knights Templar. That's what we call York right. I know people use the term York right as far as the blue, the, the, the uh, to separate it from the Scottish right craft degrees. But the the degrees rituals are much like what we all have, which is enter the apprentice, uh, fellow craft, and master mason. Um, they're 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 significantly identical for, for the American side of the coin. Um, recognizing that you may have some uh, genuflections or different gestures um, on the uh, on the Scots, Irish, and, and the British side. Uh, so recognizing their nuances there, but for lack of a better word. Um, they're they're identical. They're definitely identical to the American side of the ritual. Okay, we've got a question from Germany for you, Oscar. Besides the Grand Lodge of Hamburg, were there other European Grand Lodges that have extended recognition to Prince Hall Lodges? So they part of this has been a result of the exclusion uh, that Prince Hall Grand Lodges have um, experienced over the over the. I would say over the 200 plus years. Uh, so they haven't really paid a lot of attention to the um, to the external relationships. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, um, they somewhat have engaged in some practices that um, um, have not necessarily made, uh, made it easy. So for example, um, if you notice, I mentioned the international presence. There are several Prince Hall lodges that are, uh, that are in areas where 
their um, American military installations. Um, in some cases, it's okay if you're on the installation. Uh, and there are other scenarios like in Germany and Netherlands. Um, and, and I even had to inform brothers in England in um, in the uh, in the England at the time that you know they had military lodges on their soil, um, which they may not have known about. So. To that extent, the European uh, membership, um, there's, you know, there's several that have uh, extended, extended membership with uh, Scotland, definitely England. There's a significant heavy focus on England based on history. Uh, there's been some uh, overtures in, I believe, Italy and a few other places um, as they are beginning to get out of their shell and uh, engage a lot more with some of the international um, linkages. Okay, thank you. And France, for example, the Grand Lodge National de France. Thank you so much, Oscar, on behalf of the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, for coming along this evening and giving us a very enlightening talk into a subject that I don't think many of us are truly aware of on these aisles. Uh, so on behalf of everyone, thank you so much. Brian, next week, uh, we're staying with an American theme and we have Brother Joe Wages, Joseph Wages coming to talk to us. Uh, he's going to talk to us about the Scots Master, the Illuminati. I hear you're all getting excited about what's going to come out of that, a Dan Brown book or novel maybe, and the Royal Order of Herodom. Uh, so I hope that we can all be back here next Tuesday at seven o'clock at the same time uh, to welcome another uh, American guest to speak to us. What we now do, uh, Joseph, we unmute the mics and we let everyone say thank you and good evening to you. Uh, so once again, Oscar, thank you so much. You're free to unmute thank you. yourself. Really then. appreciate you all. And I hope I didn't speak too fast. <laughs> thank, you thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar. Well, thank you very much. Well done, sir. Well done. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Oscar. Thanks for coming, Oscar. Cheers. Thank you, Oscar. Very interesting and informative. Very informative. Very informative. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chat with Bob here. Oscar. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Oscar. Yeah, I look forward to your reply. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Oscar. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, brethren. Thank you. Oscar, thank you for that. And next year in Thundercliff Hall. And we'll do something more about the Earl of Effingham at some time when the wretched virus has gone. There you go, John. You see, I there you go. You out. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, sir. Again, Oscar. Thank you. Good night, you all. Okay, Brian, I'm going to give you your normal five. Thanks, Oscar. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. Thanks, Oscar. Thanks, Thanks, Oscar. Boys. See Something is missing. <laughs> Thank you, Oscar. That was absolutely Brilliant. enlightening. Good evening, Brian. Brilliant. Three. As ever, Brian, the comments and the chat yeah, will continue on our Facebook pages later on this evening, and I encourage you to, to do that. Thank you so much. And one. Well done, Oscar. Very good. I enjoyed that.